Well, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. It's it's just gone one o'clock, so we'll get underway. And I'll just see if I can get a thumbs up from Sophie or Bridget. You can hear me okay? Fantastic. That's all very positive. Well, welcome everyone. And, uh, and thanks again for joining us uh, today for Inside Online, part of the City of Burundara's Open House Melbourne program. Uh, I'll start by acknowledging the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people as the traditional owners and original custodians uh, of the land and pay my respects to their elders past, present and any elders who may be here today. Uh, my name's Tony Smith, as you can see. Uh, I'm the uh, Arts Programming Officer at Burundara Council. Um, and joining us today are Sophie. Uh, Sophie's gonna be managing things uh, behind the scenes for us and uh, Bridget Rasmussen, who will host today's session. And shortly I'll introduce Bridget uh, properly. And she's gonna expertly guide us uh, through this session about Hawthorne Arts Centre, Hawthorne Town Hall. Just quickly, Open House, um, uh, which is why we're here today. Open House is a worldwide movement that started in 1992. And the first Open House Melbourne happened in 2008. And that year, just eight buildings were opened up to the public, but they still received 30,000 um, visitors. So Open House Melbourne now, as we all know, is quite large in Melbourne, Ballarat and Bendigo, uh, and has become a, a fixture in our calendars. Now, last year, uh, and again this year, Open House Melbourne has had to move online to a virtual platform, which has been very challenging for everyone, but uh, it's, uh, it's been a great, a very interesting uh, process, I'm sure you'd all agree. So about today's presentation about the Hawthorne Arts Centre, Hawthorne Town Hall, the presentation will go for about 30 minutes. Bridget's going to take us through that, and we will have some Q&As at the end of the session. Um, uh, but what we'll get you to do is type those questions into the Q&A function. You'll see on the bottom of your screen, you should be able to a little Q&A button. So if you click on that, type your question in there. Um, as this is a webinar, obviously we're not able to see you, but you can see us and uh, enjoy the presentation. Type in your Q&As and we'll get to all the questions at the end of the presentation, because sometimes those questions will get answered during the presentation. And then, and Sophie will sort of uh, organise those and collate them. Um, and uh, before we, we kick off too, I also just want to make, uh, to acknowledge up front, the significant contribution to today's session made by Hawthorne Historical Society. Um, without them, a lot of this content uh, would not have been uh, collated together so, so beautifully. So Bridget Rasmussen is the Cultural Development Officer here at Burundara Council, uh, and she's a coordinator of, the, uh, of our Open House Melbourne program. Um, Burundara has been involved in Open House for, for a while, since 2017, but since Bridget's taken the helm, um, it's grown and grown. We've become a precinct partner of Open House Melbourne. And in 2019, that meant we had 6,700 visitors through some of the municipality's wonderful uh, buildings. Bridget's very passionate about Open House Melbourne. I can tell you that because I work with Bridget and she's very passionate about it and also very passionate about this facility that we're going to talk about today, the Hawthorne Town Hall. Um, her enthusiasm is infectious and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to her. Bridget, good afternoon. Hi Tony, how are you going? Oh, very well, how are you? Good thanks, embarrassed, but thank you. <laughs> I, I know it's, uh, it's a big day, a lot of presentations for you today, switching to online, but let's, let's get stuck into it. We call it the Hawthorne Arts Centre now. Um, but it wasn't always Hawthorne Arts Centre. It wasn't even always Hawthorne Town Hall. Um, can you tell us maybe a little bit about how it all started? Yep. Uh, so probably I'll take you back to 1850, where this, in the 1850, the parish of Burundara was laid out and it did include Camberwell and Kew. The, world, the word Burundara is thought to be an Indigenous word meaning the ground is thickly shaded and this was the beginning and also too this is a map of what you can see that there's the parish of Nutterwadding and Bulleen on this as well but the parish of Burundara or Hawthorne was around this area and on this map you can see roads which include uh, Power Road, Cotham and Yarra Boulevard and of course what we know now as the corner of Glenferry and Burwood Road and this is where our story is based today. So bridges were connect, built to connect Melbourne to Hawthorne. Uh, famously, you know, Bellwood Road does 
you know, you travel along towards Melbourne, it gets you through to Richmond. Uh, and then along the roads, there was uh, hotels and inns um, built and along also were, you know, along the roads were uh, bakers and forgers and drapers and bookmakers and uh, builders were established. And the first churches and schools were opened in the area. Um, and also the post office came in 1854. So the Burundara, so this whole area, the Burundara District Road Board was found and they were elected in 1856. And by 1860, Hawthorne, along with Kew, had separated from what was Burundara and which now became the municipals of, Cam uh, of Hawthorne. So Camberwell, Hawthorne and Kew were all separated uh, into municipal districts. And at this time, there was about 2,000 residents in Hawthorne. Okay. So, so it starts, so it's a very large area. You can see on that map, there's only a few streets. I'm guessing there's a few little paddocks and things, but it's, a, it's getting more populated. Roads, railroads, things are happening, and it's a bustling community. So I, I, is it about this time that it becomes apparent that we need some sort of, uh, of a town hall? And what sort of a town hall did they think? They needed. Yeah, so they decided that, yeah, the, that they needed a place to gather and a place to do business. So the first town hall was built on this site uh, of the corner of Glen Ferry and Bell Road in 1861. So this is the town hall, which is there now, is actually the second town hall. So yeah, this is the first site okay. um, and it's quite a modest building in comparison of what is there today. Um, it was designed by architect uh, Leon, Leonard Terry and built by a local contractor, uh, Charles Turner. It housed the council offices, the town hall, the courthouse, fire station and post office. Um, and also too, which is kind of cool, was that this same year that the train line was, um, was came to Hawthorne. And so this image here is an image looking from Richmond towards Hawthorne. And if you can see here, there's a little train just there. So that's the Hawthorne train station, as we see now. And in the background, we can see what is towards Glen Ferry and Burwood Road. So, yeah, and then, so in 1863, so this image is from 1861, but this, in 1863, Hawthorne was declared a borough. And some other significant things was like, so in 1865, water came to Hawthorne and in 1869 the gas came to um, and in by you know 1880s this town was growing and you know this little town hall which was on the corner of Glenfair and Build Road really wasn't cutting it anymore um, and there were calls to build something bigger to yeah make it a bit more uh, special and larger so, yeah so it went, you said it was growing quite quite quickly um, I we were talking about this the other day in just 20 years they tripled in population i think from like 2000 as you said when the first town hall was built and already it's up to 6000 population in the area so as you say um they definitely outgrown that original small building especially with all those functions in it so 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 how did they go about so what what happened now they've got to decided to build a new civic facility yeah it typical in council uh, you know, pro, um, you know the way that they work. They had to go out to tender, and a brief was drawn up. <laughs> we love a tender at council. Of course. But this is what the brief looked like. So the the roads board council decided, yeah, the best way was to have a competition, um, and this was what the brief looked like. Um, it's very tiny writing, but some things I'd like to highlight is that. The total sum to be expended on the building was not to exceed nine thousand three hundred pounds, but in the end, it actually cost sixteen thousand um, pounds. And also, to the designs for an entirely new town hall and office, it was to utilise the old materials as far as suitable, or additions to the present buildings which will be received. So, yeah, like the bricks, for instance, they were still um, were to be used, etc. And a Apparently, you could possibly still see the bricks at the back of our building um, of the current town hall. Uh, yeah, that are still there. So, you know, that was built in 1860 and there's still bricks that are still there. And this also just proves that council loves to save money. <laughs> and yeah, so there were 20 submissions uh, in, to, in total who applied. And the winner was 
John Beswick. So John was a local to Hawthorne and he lived in Harcourt Street. Um, and he built some of the most beautiful mansions there for his neighbours. And, you know, obviously he had a beautiful house as well. So, and they're still, some of them are still standing today. And also too, what's very, uh, so John, he built a lot of, well, not a lot, but a lot, I guess, in comparison to other things. But he was, uh, he built a couple of town halls around Melbourne, in particular, Brighton and Essendon and Dandenong and also Malvern, which uh, is just up the road in Malvern in Glenferry Road. So yeah. Bridget, I love, um, you talked about council tenders. I've seen some council tenders and they that's a one page <laughs> expression yeah. of interest document. If you imagine, imagine putting in a tender to build a town hall these days. That's be, what the front page looks like. <laughs> <laughs> massive. Um, that's so fantastic. So they found their architect, the designer was just down the road. Pretty much, yeah. Amazing. So the when like obviously when they build a town hall, there's a very uh, momentous occasion. That's a new word. Um, that is to lay the foundation stone. And if you lay, oh sorry, one moment. If you still walk uh, along Burwood Road, these foundation stones are still at the original front door on Burwood Road, and they were laid by the councillor and mayor of the time. And behind one of these stones is a time capsule and it's said to have the newspapers of the day and a list of councillors and I'm sure other memorabilia. And we don't know when it will be open, um, but yeah, but it'd be quite interesting to see if it's still there and still in good condition just to see what is inside it. But yeah, no plans yet. And so, then, yep. okay, sorry, go, go on. I was about to say, because I've got this really interesting image to show, and this is the actual celebration of the laying of the foundation stone. As I said, lots of people come out to see this all happen. And what's really interesting is that you might see that half the building is still there, the <laughs> post office. <laughs> so it is said that the post office, um, obviously when you, when buildings like this, if you were the postmaster, you would live there with your family. And apparently Mrs. Haberty, who was the postmistress, she did not like the new lodgings that they were provided to her on Build Road. Um, and she refused to move from the site until that her lodgings were rectified and she was given more suitable accommodation. So I just love that picture. Stubborn Mrs. Haberty. <laughs> it's extraordinary, isn't it? And yeah. so, but they, I assume they rectified her uh, living <laughs> situation pretty quickly. I hope so. Maybe she's behind the time capsule. <laughs> um, Bridge, I, I know we're about to move on to talk about the, the, the style of it, but um, you, you've got a personal connection because you've worked in a couple of those Beswick buildings, haven't you? Um, he was quite prolific as, a, as, a, as, a, as an architect and a designer in Melbourne, wasn't he? Yeah, he was quite, and like there's more buildings throughout Hawthorne he actually built. But yes, I used to work at the Drum Theatre, which was the former town hall in Dandenong. And John Beswick, actually, he was the architect and designed the building. And those these two buildings do look very similar. He built Dandenong after Hawthorne. Um, but yeah, his cousin was John Keyes, who was one of, one of the uh, members of the Dandenong uh, district road board so there was some connection there as well but I think Dan uh, Danon may have been a little jealous of what Hawthorne had and wanted pretty much the same thing and they did. <laughs> and so the, the style of those buildings of his which are, which are, you say there's a similar style um, that, that's got we, we, it's got that sort of uh, that framing of the second empire style hasn't it is that is that what we're talking about? Yes so this image which is coming up yeah so this is oh. yeah the facade was built in the second empire style and second empire style is a celebration of architectural and style and decorative arts throughout the history so the facade is john beswick's design and completed in 1889 originally it was stucco or cement render and it was unpainted until colored in 1925 so often you might see uh, of past images of a tan yellowish colour, which, uh, yeah, so that, you know, was in throughout the 1900s. And what's really interesting is that this is the facade. There is original three, uh, three buildings behind this that weren't joined. So in the centre, you had the council offices, 
and main, main hall and library upstairs. On the right hand side, uh, which is the west, is the post office and um, later became the telephone exchange as well. And then on the left was the police station and the locker and the courthouse. And you would actually access the lanes which um, were between the buildings to get to the lockup and the uh, courts because you wouldn't want criminals to come through the front door. And when you are actually walking inside, which unfortunately we can't do today, but when you're actually inside, there's still remnants of where they've been connected and you can still see the original brick work, which was there from the original build of this town hall. Yeah. That's fantastic. I had no idea. I mean, it, we knew that they had different functions, but having those that, that design element of the three separate sections is quite fascinating, isn't it? I love it. And yeah. it makes perfect sense when you when you present it in that way. Yeah. And also too, something that's fascinating is that you can see one tower from the front, but it actually has two towers, not to be Lord of the Rings confused about, <laughs> of course, but <laughs> there's two towers. So the front tower here on your left is the clock tower, which still stands today. And then at the back is the fire tower. Um, so the fire tower was uh, a lookout essentially and it did come a bit obsolete when buildings were built up around you couldn't see far out but there was a bell as well and then also too on this railing that you can see um, this is where the fire hoses used to be used to be hung out to dry between um, jobs and then also too underneath this which I don't have a picture of unfortunately but are the original stables because uh, obviously fire trucks back in the 18 late 1800s weren't there, they used to be horse and buggy. So the horses used to live in the stables and also um, the carts, obviously. But now it's uh, this, the original structure of the stables is still there, but it has been modified and it now holds, it houses our civic uh, extensive collection and artwork. So yeah. That, that is fantastic. And we are fortunate in some ways that in our in our day-to-day -day work when we are in the office we can go and wander down there and 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 see that that the kind of outlines of the stables it's quite quite weird yes and um, go visit the horse ghost yeah <laughs> and um we, but but what we're never allowed to do unfortunately is go up those towers and that's the thing that we keep plugging for i really want to uh, be able to go up uh, those towers one day um uh, it's it's amazing all those different functions, the fire department, the police, the jails, all that thing happening in the same building um, is to me, that I think that's quite amazing anyway. Mm. So it, it was obviously, it's obviously, it's a much bigger undertaking than the first town hall, a much big, uh, how long did it, or, or when did they finish building it and, and was it, and, and, and open it? Well, they, they built it pretty much within a year. And this is what um, this picture is from, it predates 1911. And we can tell that because the, there's no clock. There's no clock. In, 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 <laughs> or porticos, anyway. Uh, yeah, so this is from, it predates 1911. So the building was opened in 1889 by Mayor James Wheatley. He was the mayor of the time. And it opened with a large hall with over 800 guests. And it was called, it, it, it was mentioned that it was a splendid pile of ladies. <laughs> I think they mean by their dresses and the silk and the very fanciness, but I just found that in a newspaper, uh, it was just hilarious. Anyway, so a spell, splendid pile of ladies. And yeah, so this is an image obviously looking onto Bird Road. And yeah, so yeah, there's no clock and there's no portico because the portico, uh, which is that beautiful veranda at the front and is such a striking uh, image on Bird Road, but that came in the 1930s renovations. Yeah. Okay, well, the obvious question is, uh, I know we, we, you want to talk about the crest in a minute, but I want to talk about the clock. What, where's the clock? Why don't we have a clock? Well, yeah, the clock. Oh, this image is from actually, this is from the Proclam Proclamation Day in 1890. So the town hall was finished and ready for their Hawthorns to be announced as a city as oh. well. And then, sorry, the clock might... I might, I might just rearrange your words Tony, and just talk about the crest. This is the crest yeah, the, yeah. City, the city was proclaimed in 1890. And this is an image of um, looking up to the clock tower, which also has the crest of Hawthorne. And before I mentioned how Burundar was uh, 
it was the motto was uh, well the meaning of Burundara is um you know shaded thickly etc Burundara came up with the new motto and it was out of the shadows into sunshine which is a reference to prosperity and that whole I just think it's quite ironic and a bit cheeky them going we're going to leave this and be out to the sunshine so that's really interesting but yes onto the clock so the clock was installed in 18, sorry, 1911. Uh, and this was very, uh, no, no town hall in Melbourne was built with a clock. And this is because clocks were quite expensive. Building a town hall was expensive to start with. And then you add on to that bill of build, building, um, installing the clock, you would normally have to fundraise after it. So the council fundraised the money. And this has, it was installed by Ziegler who are responsible for the Flinders Street clocks. And this is an image that's been taken recently after the refurbishment. So we've just uh, had that completed at the start of the year. And then these images are taken of the mechanisms inside the clock, which is quite gorgeous. And yeah, it's just a real shame that it's not safe to get up there because I'm sure it would be a great tourist attraction. Also a really good hiding spot. <laughs> probably have to go up there one at a time i think it's, yeah it's definitely one at a time yeah, quite so when, did it, when did they launch the clock so the clock was uh launched in or well, started i should say in august 1911 and also here's a beautiful description of the day with uh with the hawthorne historical society has shared this with me and so i'll just read it out to you at the arrival of the appropriate moment the acting mayoress miss gibney who was the daughter of the mayor, severed a ribbon stretching from the balustrading of the balcony to the clock tower. There was a pause. And then the clock, as if conscious of the importance of the occasion, sol solemnly chimed 12 times. There was a loud cheering and much hand clapping from the street. This gave way to laughter as the hand set out to overtake the time. One o'clock flew past, then two and three, and at nine minutes past three, the new clock took up its task of recording standard time for Hawthorne. <laughs> That's so great. So, so they so they set it up to go off at, at, at to do the big dongs at when they launched it, and then it just spun around to catch up. Pretty to much. The time. <laughs> I love it. It's a it's a back to the future moment. Um, it's fantastic time catching up. It actually keeps really good. Now that I, I don't know, I've worked at Burundara for a few years now, but it always seems to keep really good time that clock, it's, which is a really, a really good thing. I'm a bit disappointed it doesn't dong all the time, so we know, you know, uh, it would probably be a little bit, a little bit um, uh, frustrating if there was a thing. And those photos are absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Um, so. One of the things that we've noticed is um, the continuing. You've already talked about the the portico coming and the clock being added. So it's always, always moving forward. So, so what happens next to the town hall? Do they keep adding bits on or taking bits away? What yeah, they keep adding stuff onto it. And so these images here, there's a variety of images, but this one obviously uh, is the first one on your left pre is after 1911, because the clock's there. And the same with the second one. And you can see that they're quite similar, but you know, I feel like they, must have envisioned a bit of a portico situation because they wanted the shelter to enter in. And I'm assuming like a lot of civic receptions, et cetera, like if it was raining, like, you know, you getting out of your car or et cetera, you needed that kind of shelter to get you into the building because, you know, Melbourne's notorious with their weather. And so this image on the right is uh, of when the portico has been installed and that is still there as today, which is gorgeous. Uh, yeah, and so this is, it does still very much butt the edge of the footpath onto Burwood Road, but you know, lots of brides and debutantes have been, you know, ushered in out of there into the car into the main hall. So yeah, and then also too, probably one of the the town that has as a Hawthorne Arts Centre, we have a, an extension which houses the town hall gallery, which is right next door. So. In 1985, the eastern side, just here uh, on the left, you can see there's motor bolts that was acquired by council and therefore they made this extension as well. So yeah. Okay. And then, so this is a view of how the Hawthorne Arts Centre is today. So here we've got on just right this side, this side would have been the, the post office and the telecommunications and also two upstairs have the caretaker residence. 
in the centre with the, uh, the additions of the portico and then you've got the courthouse just there. And then this extension in the far right of it and you see very faintly a Hawthorne Art Centre with the green uh, uh, trimming, that is the 1985 extension. So yeah, that's the Hawthorne Art Centre. Fantastic. It's a great photo too and you can see it's the thing I was just thinking, Bridget, is that with those, um, the, 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 the sorry the creation of public space on either side is what yeah. i was going to get at so that eventually by acquiring those over the years they were able to create that nice eastern what we call the eastern breezeway which is a nice public space on the um eastern side of the building and then uh the the it used to be called civic squares now called beswick square there in, in the front um quite fantastic so it's just we've talked a lot about the outside of the building bridget and the architecture and and all that stuff what about the inside of uh, Hawthorne Town Hall. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, oh, so we're gonna just go through the main highlights. There's lots to share in this building, but we'll just go through the couple of them. And probably the most grandest part of our building is the beautiful example of the Second Empire style. And this is the theater or the main hall. And it seats up to around 400 people for a theater show pre-COVID of course. And it, is, it has a busy schedule of music performances, speech nights, gigs and you know, meetings and weddings and everything in between. And last year through COVID-19, because the uh, Child uh, Health Maternal Office, they weren't able to use their offices, this space was uh, turned into an immunisation site. So we had all of the babies and uh, the school kids getting immunised last year as well. And then some features of this beautiful site is obviously, uh, I've got a stage view for you here. So this is the stage and this is um, looking towards the balcony. So the balcony out here, that was installed uh, later on. Uh, originally it didn't have the balcony at all and it's still got uh, beautiful decorations as well. Also to the left is the Juliet balcony, which was also a later addition. And this uh, would often house musicians and um, people like that for the like balls and things like that. Also too, the flooring is, is beautiful park tree floor. And that's really, it's quite a beautiful addition to the whole site. And also too, the, you can see some images on the sides of the pillars. That's, a, a, that's um, original. Um, also too, what original and you can't see now is that this roof isn't the first roof that it had, it was higher. And it also had a beautiful hand painted mural on top of um, on the roof, on the ceiling, sorry, but that's now no longer there because it just deteriorated over time. But it, the roof was lowered because of ventilation. And also to something which is absolutely magnificent is probably our chandeliers. And here they are in all its glory. So these have obviously been updated. These were installed in the 1930s and they are on a winch so they can be lowered and brought back up, but also to adapted to be colourful and just really beautiful throughout um, the evening. So there are chandeliers. And also too, there's this image that we're not too sure where it's actually uh, come from. It's an older image, but this is a really good indication of how it could have looked like around the 1890s when it opened up. And you'll see through the windows that the, you can see that how they the building brought in the light because the buildings weren't connected. So this is an actual, you know, beautiful, and there's a stage at the back, so that original stage, the marbling, which was donated in the, um, by James, he was the builder uh, of the 1890 building, he donated the marbling as well. And then this image is also pre-balcony, but you can also see the gorgeous uh, paintings and uh, decorations that adorned it, and obviously the older chandelier, so this is pre-1930s. Uh, and then also to some events, which, you know, every, every town loves a dead ball. And here's some of the deads over the year. And the way that, see the Juliet balcony at the top left hand photo, how the musicians are up in the balcony. And obviously the bottom left hand ladies all have the same hairdresser as well. <laughs> and then also to here, this is a, uh, this is how much many people they could have fitted in. And if you're all having panic attacks about social distancing, I can understand. But this is um, from the Hawthorne Football Club have a, a great connection with the town hall um, over the years. Apparently they have said to have their AGMs at the Hawthorne Town Hall each year. 
Um, and I'm not very good with fit footballers, but if the name of Titch is it any um, rings any bells, this is this gentleman down here that looks a bit stuffed, but it was a night to honour him. Um, I'll just I'll zoom in because it's it's a great photo of him. Obviously, he's the one with the very wide eyes. But, <laughs> And just the way that, yeah, it was literally packed to the rafters. Bridget, that 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 photo absolutely freaks me out, for, even without social distancing, because we all talk about, you know, fire safety and egress and all those sorts of things for, for patrons. No one's getting out of that place in a hurry. Nice. It's so packed in. It's, it's phenomenal. And I wonder, too, I was just noticing where those kids are sitting. It looks like it's got carpet there. So I'm not sure if that's a carpet runner or if they actually had some carpet on the floor at one point. So um, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, because you know, the wood floors was out at one stage and carpet was in. So how big would that have carpet have been? <laughs> yeah. And I, I I don't see anyone smoking, but I know back then too, everyone was smoking away. Yeah. So it would have been smelly carpet. <laughs> yes. And then some other of our beautiful rooms um, also include the chandelier room, which is right next door. So this was once the site of the post office and was converted by, it was converted later after the post office moved and it was uh, built by John Coach in 1911. It was labelled the small hall, but this confused people. So they called it the chandelier room in 1950, but we're not too sure maybe I think it should have been called the candelabra room because they look more like candelabras than chandeliers. <laughs> However, it's called the chandelier room, but it's a beautiful room that we have at the Hawthorne Art Centre, which is regularly used again by meetings and often weddings before they head into the main hall from the reception. So that's beautiful. And another feature, of course, is our grand staircase. Uh, this was one of, this was a 1930 edition. And this replaced the original stairs, which led up to the council offices and the library. Um, it's made out of Lily Dale's finest marble. And also too, you'll see that there's a stained glass window at the top of it. This was uh, gifted by John Beswick at the time. And it's said to have been have relocated from somewhere else in the building. But if you look closely, the word prosperity features uh, quite prominently in it. And this could possibly be an ode to that original brief and the original thinking of building Hawthorne and, you know, stepping out into the sunshine and uh, having a bit of prosperity. So as you take the very beautiful staircase and they're quite, there's many of them, but this leads you up into this beautiful uh, foyer upstairs and it's a shared meeting uh, room. So you would walk in and you see, be this amazing foyer. And I just love these skylights, which were added into is the 30s so it's a real ode to the um the art deco of the time and that style and also to the beautiful uh light light fixtures and everything like that and then probably another one of the uh, most curious rooms in the space in this in the Hawthorne Art Centre is what we call the chamber it wasn't originally the chamber this was originally the courthouse and if you can imagine when this building was originally built this flooring wasn't there it was actually just a very tall courthouse and people originally complained because the voices would just be lost in the air. So when council did acquire it, they actually built a mezzanine floor to make it to make this room into the courthouse. But this is the original trust and also the lantern style esque. And why I say this is one of the most curious rooms is because there is a bullet hole in our left window. Oh, we love this story, Bridget. And we have lots of theories, uh, you know, we throw around Squizzy Taylor, who was, um, his gang was quite infamous around some of the, uh, you know, stuff that used to happen in Hawthorne with the bank robberies, et cetera. But my friends at the Hawthorne Historic Society um, and I possibly think it's actually from the time when it was the court and the police station because the bullet hole, it looks like the bullet has come from inside and shot out to the outside. And it's a ball, it's not like a, not that I've seen too many, you know, bullet holes through windows, but it looks like a ball, ball bearing bullet. So that goes and gets shooting out there. So that's I, a, a bit of fun and it's a bit of mystery and well, it's amazing how rumours get started. <clears throat> yeah, Bridget, that's your, that's fine to, to deal with facts and ballistic reports, but in my heart, I'm sure that it's Squizzy Taylor yeah. shooting that. Yeah, with from the outside, the for some reason, yeah. <laughs> some some yeah. exotic happening. Yeah, 
but also too that this chamber uh, it's good to note that obviously we're not the city of Hawthorne we're the city of Burundara and this is where the last council of Hawthorne met before they re, um, before we were re-amalgamated re, re with Kew and Cam uh, Campbell to become the city of Burundara. So that is the Hawthorne Art Centre today well today but it's you know how it has turned it probably quite significantly because in 2013 Pedal Thorpe architects were engaged to reimagine and redevelop the town hall into the Hawthorne Art Centre today. And today it comprises of a gallery and performance spaces, uh, Burundara Arts three, uh, Youth Services and function rooms and artist studios. And once you step inside, and I wish we could be there together to go through it, but it's, it truly is a beautiful example of how you can perfectly blend 19th and 20th century architects together with them um, and just be able to evolve the building and meet community needs because a building as beautiful as is, it still needs to adapt to what the community needs. And one of those community needs is what I mentioned is Burundara Youth. So Burundara Youth can be found upstairs in the building and it was previously located in Camberwell and the space which was housed out in Camberwell was not necessarily accessible for all young people. So as part of the 2000 redevelopment of the art centre, Burundara Youth was moved there. And it's a fantastic space. I wish I was young, <laughs> but their essential service, they support the health and wellbeing of young people. Um, and, you know, they have targeted programming and social and recreational drop-in sessions, which is this space is so, is perfect for. And yeah, and then just one-on-one -on -one generalised support. And in pre-COVID in 2019, they had, um, approximately about 3,300 young people through the site. And yeah, and if you know a young person in the Burundara, they're very happy to welcome them up there. They've got Nintendos and Playstations and table tennis tables and everything like that. So it's amazing. And then I suppose another thing which Tony, you can provide us because you're such, you know, a programmer, <laughs> but is what we do in the space as well. So Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Bridge. I mean, we keep talking about it evolving, but it's still uh, a place where cultural events happen. It always has been. So there's a range of things that Burundara program there. So we have a performing arts program. Uh, we often put on in the main hall or the chandelier room. We have beautiful gallery spaces, which are, which are a new addition uh, to the town hall, to the art center, excuse me. Um, and then the facilities that are used for, you've got the community art space there. Um, we have other rooms, of course. So a whole range of programs of performing arts, community cultural development activities. Um, we, of course, have the Burundara Steadford, which is one of Australia's best of Steadfords, um, takes place. Is that our beautiful Steinway Grand Piano? I think it is. We're very fortunate to have a, a lovely Steinway Grand Piano there. Um, uh, you can see uh, some of the musical performances and some of the use of the space. So. As, as well as Burundara programming there, lots of other places program there. We have Camberwell uh, Showtime happening um, every year. We have lots of community activities um, using the spaces for both uh, performing arts, community arts, and also exhibitions. I mean, part of our um, uh, Town Hall Gallery exhibition program is reserved exclusively for local artists. So some really cool things. And, and one of my favorite bits, talking about this, looking at the Steinway there on the stage, uh, we talked about all the changes in the spaces over the years and, and all the additions and um, but the the raked stage so if, if people know what a raked stage is it's it's a slight slope so not every stage has this but the Hawthorne Arts Centre main stage has a slight rake on it and it's really is from the bygone days when because everyone's sitting flat on the floor so that you can see the people at the back of the stage they're slightly higher um, so that's that's a very old fashioned uh, way of staging things. And it is always just a little reminder when you're wheeling the Steinway Grand Piano out onto the stage, you just have to keep an extra eye on it to make sure it doesn't get a bit of momentum and roll off the front because no one wants that. No mm -hmm. one wants that. But it's it, yeah, such beautiful buildings. And, and the other thing, Bridget, as we we're talking about is so much of it is still is accessible to people anytime free of charge. To come into that you can we can i mean some places you can't get into because activities are taking place but but the foyer spaces the stairway the galleries lots of the spaces uh you can just wander in and have a look around and they're quite beautiful aren't they yeah and nine times out of ten sometimes if you see a staff member walking past they're like oh can we pop into the main hall but 
not open, most yeah. likely we'll just let you pop in and see it as well, just so you can get it. Yeah. And hopefully next year we'll be able to deliver the Open House Melbourne program so we all can book on a tour and do it in person. <laughs> so, so Bridget, I think that wraps up the formal part of the presentation. Yes. Is that correct? Well, thank you very much. And that's a, just a, a wonderful job, Bridget. Thank you so much for that. It was so interesting. Um, and I told you that Bridget was passionate about Open House Melbourne and that building in particular, I reckon. Um, uh, so uh, it was a it was a pretty quick pivot last week for you to switch from being doing the in person stuff to the online stuff. So well done, and thank you so much for all that. Um, uh, in a minute, we'll go to Sophie to sort of coordinate some of the Q and A's. Um, uh, and while that's happening, I also I want to do another special call out and thank you to the Hawthorne Historical Society um, and, and Bridget and I both know how much work they put into um, researching and, and finding out that information and collating it, putting it together. Uh, and they've made such a great uh, support and contribution to the Open House Melbourne weekend. I'm sure you'd agree, Bridge. Yeah. Um, oh, and uh, and while I'm while I'm doing that, when we reopen, there's a, a small exhibition or, or an exhibition at least in the upper foyer um, uh, for people to come along and have a look. It'll contain some memorabilia uh, from the town hall over the years. Including so, the original keys. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. It looks, it's amazing. <laughs> this is so much, so much stuff. So, Sophie, uh, over Sorry. to you for some cues. Thank you, Bo. Now, we've got so many questions and lots of really interesting comments. One question I know we're wondering ourselves, which is uh, when Hawthorne drops the E, so if anyone knows any historians or linguists out there, we would love to know as well. Yeah, um, no idea. <laughs> <laughs> wondering where the library was located upstairs. That, I'm not too sure. The one th thing we haven't located is actually the original plans of the site, which is a bit shame, but I like, if you come in, when you come into the Hawthorne Arts Centre, you can kind of, you can kind of understand where it could have been. But my guess is, yeah, it would have been um, up towards the back, I guess, near, like towards the fire station. But yeah, it's just really hard to tell yeah. where things could have been without those original plans. Um, we have found, just before Open House Melbourne, uh, Emily Grant from the libraries have located some plans and we were going to get them out for Open House Melbourne. But Alas, we couldn't do it. So I'd be really keen to find out more information about that. But if you come next year, we may find out more about where it is. <laughs> so we've had a little bit of history shared in that WD Fielding was the clock keeper employed by council for about 30 years to keep it working. And he had a number of clock shops in Hawthorne and on Burke Road. So that's lovely to know. Mm -hmm. Wondering how many rooms did the caretaker get? <laughs> Hi, yeah, I'm sure there again. I know that there's, uh, so where the caretaker, um, and interesting, they live, uh, care, the caretaker lived with his family up until the 90s, but there's six artist studios now, so um, in where the caretaker space used to be. So you, it was like an extra little, you know, used to go up the side. Um, yeah, so I'm unsure, but he, there was a family, a couple of kids and his uh, wife and lived all there together. It so must have been a reasonable size, yeah. I think a reasonable apartment size, yeah. yeah. And um, there's some funny stories about the Historical Society, which I'm sure they'll share on next year's Open House Melbourne Tour, they'll share with you then, um, in regards to the role that they played and how much fun the kids used to have running around the hall. There's actually a colleague that we work with at Burundara that they remember playing with the kids in the main hall when she was growing up and she's probably about, my, about 40. So, yeah, interesting. Wonderful. As someone has shared that they believe the glass uh, where the bullet hole is is done in a 1930s modern style motif. So that's possibly when that occurred yeah. to add to the mystery there. Yeah, well, also too, it's good to note that it's double glazed. So one part has the hole in it, not the other part. So whether it, the glaze came in 1930s, which is that kind of style, or and they just, they wanted to keep it for prosperity reasons, but they really should have written why. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we know any history regarding the faces painted on the wall in the town hall? No, we don't. 
yeah, I know I've had a conversation with the Hawthorne Historic Society about this. We don't know why, but it's very of the moment in the 1890s to have set, um, like there was a lot of famous um, artists that used to do these murals. And another famous site in Burundara, which is Villa Alba Museum, they've got fam um, famously decorative um, artwork, which is around the same era. So it was kind of like, if you could afford a muralist to come and do this hand-painted work, that would have been, you know, that just demonstrates how much, you know, prestige you were, I guess. So yeah, but no, we don't really have any history about why the women were on the, yeah. Well, we've been very lucky. Emily Grant is watching and has answered our question about the E. Oh. Apparently Hawthorne was always spelt both ways. And the first call to meeting to become their own municipality um, had the E, but the minutes dropped it really quickly. So around 1860. Oh, so people couldn't be bothered spelling it properly. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I like that working. I'm going to adopt um, that one. <laughs> one last fun one. Is the hall said to be haunted? Is the hall haunted? No. <laughs> However, um, I laughed, be I joked before how there was a, a woman in the toilet. So on looking at this image now on the right hand side, there's some toilet it's next to the Zelman. But there's said to be a woman haunting the toilets upstairs. And also two downstairs in the stable, which I mentioned has now been modified to um, house our collection people like staff members have been by themselves and doors have locked behind them or something very odd has happened in that space and people hear random stuff I joke that they're horse ghosts but yeah but we don't really know of any like um like why you know for instance that woman is there like there's no reports that anyone's died but you know me, knowing that that side of the building was a lockup um, was a police station and who knows what happened and what you know spirits are on that land still if you believe in such things but I always joke about the horse ghost because you know nay, they make noise anyway. <laughs> and I like to freak people out <laughs> thank you so much I think that is all the questions we can get through there's lots of thank yous thank you thank you <laughs> thanks everyone coming thanks thanks Bridget and, and Bridget I just want to wrap up if I oh well if we're going to wrap it up one of the things that we talked about and that we love is that even if you go back for all the changes and all the things that, that have, have happened, the different uses it's been, it's it's still a wonderful public civic open facility. And I was thinking about all the, the um, even though council's not there, I was just thinking about even the good old fashioned town hall meetings that still happen. Like when the community have a big issue, they can still gather in that hall and thrash it out. Uh, and and that's a that's a really nice thing about that facility that that over the time it's still there and it's maintained and it's kept as a it's a beautiful piece of architecture but it's also an important part of the community isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there was even uh, last week I think or uh, pre shut down the lockdown whatever we call it there was a little there was a group of schools doing climate action um, and talking about that amongst themselves and you know, talking about their future. And that's just amazing. In another 50 years, you know, what are they going to say about this space? And, you know, and in saying that too, we love to learn more about this space. So if you do have stories and um, history that you want to share, or, you know, you want to share where your parents met at the dance on a Saturday night, et cetera, or um, yeah, like, you know, if you're from Camberwell Showtime and you've had, just had a performance here in the last couple of years, like tell us about that because people are going to want to know the story of this place. You know, when it turns 200 in, about 50 years or 60 years. Oh, are you going to be hosting? Uh, I'll still be here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. Bridget, thank you so much. Sophie, thanks Thanks for your work there. That's wonderful. I'm so glad everyone uh, enjoyed it. I can see the comments and the and the, and the, and the Q and questions of the Q&As coming through. That's great. Bridget, a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much for taking us through the history. It was really enjoyable. Um, really great. So. Looking forward to next year's Open House Melbourne and uh, having you guide us all through on a personal tour of the building. For 25 cents. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks Thank everyone. That, that wraps it up. Have a lovely day.